Well, today we're going to be in John chapter 8, and we'll be looking at the conflict between the darkness and the light. And uh, we'll see this in the, the life of this uh, certain lady, the Pharisees, and our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to call your attention as we begin just to the first five verses, because uh, we'll be coming back to those a little bit later. Now, early in the morning, notice those five, ver- five words. Now, early in the morning... He came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and Jesus sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, the first five words, I ask you to remember those now early in the morning. And as I was studying for the message, it occurred to me that there are certain characteristics associated with the morning. In Psalm 5.3, the psalmist said, my voice you shall hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. So the morning time is in the Bible is a time of prayer. According to Psalm 35, it's also a time of joy. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It's also a time of praise according to Psalm 92 verses 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning. And it's also a time to be refreshed with God's mercy, his compassion, and his faithfulness. And this is what we find in one of my favorite verses out of the Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 through uh, 23. Through the Lord's mercies were not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. Well, when we come to John chapter 8, and we begin to examine this particular chapter in this section of the chapter, we notice that it begins with a sinful woman who's about to be stoned. When you go ahead and read the chapter, you'll find that it ends with a sinless man who's about to be stoned. It begins with a woman who is an immoral outcast, and it ends with a moral man harassed. And it begins with an allegation Verses 2 through 5, the scribes and Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now there's some speculation about this, that the woman was probably set up. That some of the scribes, some of the Pharisees, uh, set her up so they, could, so they could catch her in the act and bring her to Jesus to see what Jesus would do. And what they were trying to do was get Jesus between a rock and a hard place. But, it, what, but when it says she was caught in the very act, there are some people that believe that they brought the woman unclothed and threw her at the feet of Jesus to try to embarrass him and to shame the woman even more. And they said, well, what do you say? What do we do? Now, I want you to remember something. This chapter begins early in the morning, which would mean at the light of day, and it focuses on something that happened in the darkness of the night. And here we see the correlation between sin and darkness, and throughout the pages of Scripture we find that correlation. In Romans 13, 12, it tells us the night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And we're living in a time where there is a lot of darkness and we are to be the light bearers. We're to put on the armor of life and light and take a stand for Jesus Christ. 
Then 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. John says, this is a message which we've heard from Jesus and declare to you. He's saying, I got this as firsthand knowledge and I'm passing on to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now notice what it says. <clears throat> Basically, if we're going to talk the talk, we need to walk the walk. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and if we walk in darkness, he says that we're lying and we do not practice the truth. Excuse me, I, one of the rules of preaching is to not have anything in your mouth but my allergies are, are affecting my voice a bit today. Ephesians 4, <coughs> Paul says, he spoke about the former life and the people who were not Jews, and he said they were darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God. <clears throat> he says their hearts were hard, and they had no sense of shame, and they've given themselves over to sensuality with an ever-increasing desire to practice every kind of impurity. So we see that sin <clears throat> is associated with darkness. The deeds, the desires, and the darkness of the scribes and Pharisees was every bit as dark and sinful as was the sin of this woman. But you know what? Jesus still loved her. And there will never come a time in our life where we can stray so far that God will not love us. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him should be saved that he could come and live out the principles, the precepts, and the finest points of the law to fulfill it. And as Paul said, he took it to the cross, nailing it to the cross, that we might have salvation in him. John went on to say in John 3, 19, this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And isn't that the truth today? People would rather live in a life of darkness and sin than come to the light and know Jesus as their Savior. Well, among the scribes, the Pharisees, and the crowd that had gathered, there was an unforgiving spirit of self-righteousness that was void of compassion and any attitude of restoration. And that is not what the church should be today. <clears throat> Martin Luther King Jr. said, Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And the only thing this woman was experiencing from the religious authorities of the day, from the scribes and the Pharisees, was a sense of vile hatred. St. Francis said, where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Now I see something else in this passage of scripture. I see the legislation in verses, or chapter 8 and verse 5. <clears throat> and he's speaking about Moses in the law, if you recall the verse, verse 5 earlier. He said, Jesus, what are you going to do? Moses in the law commanded us to do certain things. And here it is, Leviticus 20 and verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of another man, if he commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulterer must certainly be put to death. Rod of iron mentality. That's what the Old Testament was. <coughs> Excuse me. The purpose of the law was to teach us that we can't save ourselves and that we needed some help. And that's why Jesus stepped down out of the heavens was willingly to go to the cross and die for our sins, was to fulfill the law that he could usher in, usher in the era of grace. Then the expectation of the woman, also in verse number five. What do you think her expectation was? She knew how harsh the scribes and the Pharisees could be. She knew how burdensome the, the man-made laws were that they'd created. <clears throat> she had been caught in the very act of adultery, and I think she expected to die. I think she expected to be stoned and left for dead. 
<clears throat> but you know, the truth is this. Every one of us are like this woman. We're all sinners. We've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. And God says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Now notice the stipulation in verse number 7. When they connect, continued asking him, when the scribes and the Pharisees continued asking, and I mean it was like just peppering him time and time again. i tell you what it was like. I think it's like one of the press conferences when the news media is trying to get on the president or trying to get on his press secretary. And they're all shouting different questions at her, trying to trip her up or trip him up in, in some something he might say. That's what they were doing with Jesus. But Jesus said, if there's anybody out here who's never sinned, why don't you pick up the first stone and throw it at her? That'd leave me out. And it left everybody else out, and they realized it. It reminds me of that principle out of Galatians 6, 1 through 3, and how we ought to interact with one another. Paul said, if a person is caught in some trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a person in a spirit of humility, carefully watching yourselves so that you are not also tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. For someone thinks he's something like the scribes and Pharisees when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Notice what it says. If somebody's caught in a trespass, Paul said, the, you who are spiritual, restore them. The question I ask is, if there's no restoration, where are the spiritual people? And then the tabulation, verses 8 and 9. And again, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now this is just speculation. <clears throat> Nobody knows what Jesus wrote. But is it possible that the first time he stooped down and he wrote in the ground that he wrote out the Ten Commandments? And the second time when he stooped down to write in the ground, he began to list the sins. He maybe wrote down Stan Seymour and wrote the sin out there beside it or whatever the name of these other men were. That's speculation. I don't know. But the thing that, that gets me is this. <clears throat> now listen to this. Then again Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one. And I've always been curious about why that phrase is in there. Were they hearing their conscience convicting them? Because Jesus had already written once and he stood up and then he bowed down to write again. But it's while he stooped down and writing on the ground, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience. I don't know if they were still thinking about what he had said the first time, but I don't know about you, sometimes my conscience sh shouts at me. You know, about every day, to be honest with you, it shouts at me. So I don't know, but they were convicted. And then it says they went out one by one. <clears throat> and the oldest started and then the youngest. Did the oldest leave first because they were at the top of the list and Jesus had listed everything there was and they went out silent because they were shamed by what everybody else could read that they'd done and Jesus was calling them out? I, I'm telling you, it's sheer speculation. I don't know that that is what happened. But I do know what the Bible says in Matthew 7. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For by the standard you judge, you will be judged, and the measure you use will be the measure you receive. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eyes but fail to see the beam in your own eye? And then Jesus called the Pharisees on that occasion hypocrites. And he said, you need to get the two by four out of your eye before you worry about the toothpick in somebody else's eye. But did you get this? The standard that you used to be judged is how you will be judged yourself. So Jesus said, according to the Mosaic law, maybe, if you're without sin, pick up the stone. You throw the first one. You know, it's impossible to live a life without making judgments. But we can try to live a life without being judgmental like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. 
judgmentalism is what we saw with these scribes and Pharisees were there. It was a holier than thou, thou attitude, that, and they were displaying an attitude of moral superiority. You know, the Bible does tell us to make judgments. In chapter 7 and verse 24, it said, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. In Ephesians 5.11, it says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. But we are not to be judgmental. Whatever we do, we need to do it in a spirit of love and compassion with the goal of restoration. Now notice the culmination in verses 10 through 11. When Jesus raised up, I saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Now according to the Mosaic law, there had to be an accuser and then a witness. The accuser's gone. The witnesses are gone. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, Jesus didn't excuse the sin, but he did challenge her to live a life of, sin, of, 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 of righteousness. R.C. Sproul once said, it's important that when we're engaged in admonition or exhortation or confrontation, with a brother who has overcome in sin, we call attention to truth in an extraordinarily compassionate and tender and loving spirit. Jesus didn't excuse the woman. He responded in grace and challenged her to sin no more. He wanted the woman to know that even though her life had been tarnished by sin, that in him she could find an advocate to help her. That's what John wrote about in chapter 2 of 1 John. My children... I write these things to you so that, no, so, so that you will not sin. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. I want to give you about four thoughts to take with you today. Remember, there will always be a self-righteous crowd who will accuse you and misuse you. And that's certainly what this woman found. And... Uh, and sadly, that is what many people see in the church today. You know, what they see are, you know, they say the church is full of hypocrites, people who go out and live one way and demand that I live another. So there will always be people, uh, a self-righteous crowd, who will accuse you and misuse you, and that's what happened to this poor woman. Secondly, remember that even though the New Testament mandate is to bear one another's burdens, there will always be some who would rather bury you than help carry you in your burdens. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and heavy, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Number three, remember that Jesus is as ready to forgive you as he was to show forgiveness and mercy to that woman. And then number four, remember that in Christ, we are a new creation. One of my favorite verses is that verse out of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But in Christ, Paul says our, our, that we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. In Christ, we have an inheritance based on God's eternal plan. And in Christ, we have the promise of the Spirit's presence who will lead us in truth and lead us into righteousness. And when Jesus said, woman, I'm not condemning you, go and sin no more, I think he was challenging her to find out who she could be in him. Would you bow with me in prayer? Well, Father, as we come now, <clears throat> it's my prayer, Father, that you might uh, be with each of us, that we can learn a lesson of life in this passage of Scripture, that we might identify.